Bev and and uh, Matt, I haven't had a chance to have a conversation with you, but I've heard good things. I saw you in the news recently um, um, and you conducted yourself very well, sir. So hopefully we get a chance to talk. Um, um, and, and so one, I am a big advocate of restorative justice and many of the, po many of the things that we're doing um, um, are aligned with that, um, at least underlying those policies. Um, and then we're also looking to do some other things that I'll talk about in a quick second too. So um, when, when we look at expanding diversion programs, when we look at um, the way that we try to avoid people who don't need to see the end of a jail or see the inside of a jail, um, when we implement policies to, to keep people out, for example, instead of issuing warrants on low level felonies, issuing summonses, uh, because because when you issue a warrant, uh, issue a warrant, person's got to go to jail, whether it be for some hours or days or months or years, they got to go to jail. But when you issue a summons, they can just show up for, they can just show up um, just like they would for a ticket. Um, but also, we're in the, we've been working with some some local leaders on um, working on more um, um, restorative justice, um, um, hopefully a clinic, if you will. Um, that's something that we would that we you know we will. We're hoping to already have established, but COVID has slowed us down, obviously. Um, but we understand that um, restorative justice brings resolution and closure to all parties involved, um, not just the uh, the defending getting a uh, you know maybe some alternative to incarceration. But what we found is that, is that restorative justice also is beneficial for the victims because they get an opportunity when they when they choose to um, talk and and um, talk to you know and have those discussions and conversations with the and with the defendant present uh, where they can um, let the defendant know how that impacted them and that can also often have a, a that can often have a uh, a positive impact on all the parties and bring that sense of closure and and. And, and, and the feeling that one is heard. So big advocate of restorative justice, something that our office looks to do uh, much more of, and, and I'm sure uh, the, other, uh, the other panelists have more to say on that too. Okay, so Mr. Uh, Ms. Haber, you've seen what those programs and how they work from your perspective as a public defender. Can you show, share with us what, what the impact is and if it helps, does it work? What does it do? How are we doing that? Sure, um, and again, thank you to everyone for participating today, for attending, and, and uh, it's nice to be included in these types of conversations because they're important and they're really critical to our community. This isn't just about those individuals that are um, involved in the criminal justice system, uh, but it really is about the community because I think what people often forget is you know, you look at it and you say, oh, those people, those people, whatever that means. Um, those people are your neighbor and uh, your cousin and your sister. Uh, those are people that, that we all care about. And so making sure that there are alternatives to, to the system and to getting stuck in what we've all heard about is, you know, the cycle of jails and prisons um, and courtrooms. And so some of the programs that Mr. Bell was talking about, we've seen here in the county have um, benefited our clients. There is always more to do, and I don't think anyone would, would deny that, but uh, I think what's important to remember is that a majority of the cases uh, that involve people getting criminally justice informed are due to not wanting to be a criminal. Most people don't want to commit crime. They are dealing with substance abuse. They are in a um, unhealthy or an abusive relationship. They are living with mental illness. And those things, if not properly treated, can often result in you being criminally justice involved. And that's the programs, that's the focus um, that we have seen for our clients that can really make a difference. Uh, we have clients, it's not uncommon to have a client that has four or five stealing cases pending, maybe in St. Louis County. And then they have a stealing in the city. They have a burglary in St. Charles. And you're like, what is going on? They don't want to steal. They're not excited about stealing. They have a substance abuse problem and they need drug treatment or they have a mental health issue and they need to be hooked up with services 
to provide mental health care. And uh, what Mr. Bell's office has um, tried to champion and, and is doing is allowing us to argue those issues for our clients and making that part of their, um, of their case. So that instead of saying, you know what, just send them to prison, which is not where they need to be, uh, we're looking at being able to get them more involved in programs. And that's really a great thing for the individual, for their families, like Mr. Bell said, for the, uh, the victims as well, uh, and for the community as a whole, because now we're creating an environment where people are re-engaging in their community and putting uh, value back into their community. And that's really, um, that's really what this is about. And um, prison is not the place. Most folks don't go to prison and come out a reformed contributing individual. Uh, most folks that go to prison come out angry because they didn't get anything that they needed while they were there uh, to help improve their situation. So um, getting involved in the community and having what we often, you'll hear us talk about wraparound services uh, is really the difference for those that are criminally justice informed. So how do we, how do we work with that? Mr. Mahaffey, I'm gonna come to you. We, are, are you seeing any programs in the city that may look or, or be uh, restorative justice and how are they working? What, what's the impact that you're having on your side in the St. Louis city area? Uh, good question. Thanks again for having me. Sorry for that glitch there. I'm back home in Iowa, so I had to switch to internet connections. Um, there's not much internet because there aren't many people here. Um, the, we, there are some available in the city. Uh, there, and, and Ms. Gardner's office has started to they're implementing a lot of diversion programs there. Um, I think in terms of the traditional definition of restorative justice, I don't know if that's, there are, there are a fair a few that are available there. Um, there is one that is going to be launched in April. It's called the Freedom Community Center. It's going to be run by Mike Milton, who is currently a, a, a managing person at the Bail Project. Uh, and the bail projects tried to advance what they've been doing to, to look more of a restorative justice. So the bail project, for those that don't know, is an organization that will post bail for individuals, but they also provide services that the court might identify that they want the individual to have. And ideally, it's self-identified services from the individual and not just uh, an edict. Um, but Mike is leaving the bail project, and this is public knowledge, so I know I'm not disclosing anything I can't to start a place called the Freedom Community Center, and he's hoping in April. And the goal behind that is to start engaging on cases that I think traditionally we don't think about as cases that would be available for alternative disposition. Um, and the idea being providing services, and his is a holistic thought, which is he's, he's hoping to have a trauma-informed person on staff, mental health specific, substance, substance specific, and then also obviously connections with places like Places for People and other direct service providers so that they're meeting the needs of both complaining witnesses, anyone I would say that is criminally legally involved, regardless of how we typically see sides to be, that could be useful services. And then obviously within the restorative justice model by involving everyone. And I think as Mr. Bell accurately put, the, the framework at the beginning of restorative justice is buy-in from all parties. It doesn't work if you don't have that buy-in from everyone. So I think it's his, the goal I've been, talking with Mike about in other places that are doing this is that you present to the court a holistic plan that is involving everyone involved in, in a situation from the onset and hopefully diverting that almost immediately. I mean, I think part of, I don't know, I won't speak for Beverly, but I think one of our ideals would be that we're not involved in some of these instances because maybe a charge hasn't been issued. It's been identified as a possibility but then there's processes being worked through to accomplish hopefully a positive outcome that doesn't involve the normal involvement with the criminal legal system. So let me push back on that a little bit, just, just, just a little bit, just as a devil's advocate, somebody's got to do it. Some, <laughs> it's got to happen. So here we are, somebody has been caught murdering somebody and you want to give them a diversion program. Is that, that what I'm hearing? Okay, no, 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 no. Tell me, no. tell me, tell me what it is. No, we, 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 um, um, we're talking the low level nonviolent crimes, um, drug possession, as Bev talked about, and things related to drugs, drugs. And keep in mind, I think it's estimated somewhere in the 80% range of the cases that come through the criminal justice system 
um, have something to do with drugs, whether it be possession or stealing for drugs, as was talked about earlier, something connected to it and, and mental health. And so we have so many people who they start going into the cycle of incarceration and they come out with a worse, worse substance abuse issue, a worse mental health um, issue, and they, um, and they graduate to more violent crimes because we're not giving them the support that they need. Now, once someone crosses that line um, of violence and harming people, they're gonna have to be held accountable. And, and that said, we're still gonna be fair with them, uh, but you know, we're gonna have to make sure that we're doing the things that keep residents safe. So um, absent um, um, far and few um, um, exceptions, we do not, we're not talking about your violent and serious offenders. And, and I'll even say this, Shira, real quick. We had one individual who assaulted a, a person uh, um, and his wife actually, and we don't take those into um, domestic violence, but the public defender asked for us to consider this one because there were some special circumstances. They had been married 20 years. There was absolutely no history and the victim didn't want him to be prosecuted. She just wanted him to get the help and advocated for that. And so that's one where we took to our diversion advisory committee that we work with, uh, with the uh, Diversion uh, Council of St. Louis. And that's one that we, we made an exception to, but that's one. But aside from that, we do not, um, the, it's, we're talking the low level violent offenders that we're trying to get on a different path um, to get them out of the, the criminal justice system. Okay. So murderers, Shira, come on now. <laughs> not right, right. But it's <laughs> but I appreciate the question. I know so the question's out there. Here, and I'm trying to make sure that we get all of that information out because it's what people hear when they're thinking, yep. if somebody robbed me blind, I lost a household full of furniture, and you're gonna give them diversion and nothing happens. I want to make sure that when we talk about it, that it's clear that you're of uh, the population about which you're speaking. So to just push uh -huh. back a little bit more. Um, you're supposed to be Mr. Law and Order. How is it that you can balance keeping citizens safe, an election, and a diversion project? And I'll say the same thing to the public defenders. How is it that you just want to let people out on the street and run wild, rob me, because because maybe I don't have a gun, so maybe they're not killing me, but they rob me. That I'm 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 out of my food. I'm out of everything. And, and will just lead to anarchy. How do we, what information can listeners have to negate that or to understand what it is you mean when you're saying diversion programs and how you balance keeping citizens safe with those diversion programs? Ms. Harbour? Sure, so I think, um, so there's a perception of public defenders that exact, exactly that, right? Well, they just wanna let everybody out on the street. I'm not familiar with that. Um, that that's that's not what we do here. Um, but what we what we do, and and I understand that that is, if you're not in, informed of all the different moving parts, it might look like that. Um, but that's not what's happening here. I think as public defenders, um, what we are trying to do and what our goal is, number one, is to make sure that every single one of our clients has the rights that are afforded to them under the constitution because then they're charged with a crime that does not mean they're guilty of a crime it means that they've been charged and it's just something that is important to remember when people are sitting here in the county jail i'm in here in the jail building right now we have about a thousand people here in the jail 70 percent of those people approximately sitting in the jail have not pled guilty to or been found guilty of anything they are literally sitting here waiting for that determination to be made. And when we are talking about diversion programs and um, holistic representation and wraparound services, we're talking about why is this person here? Is it a choice of something that, that they got involved in? Wrong place, wrong time. Like we said, maybe a drug problem, maybe an untreated mental health issue. And these are people and I, it's something that you have to remember that we're not just talking about numbers, we're not talking about statistics, although the data is important and the data will show you that when people are released, uh, the MacArthur Safety and Justice Foundation, if you're not familiar, is something that everyone should look into. Um, they have been collecting data for approximately five years on some of this 
exact issue of, well, we're just going to let everybody out and we're going to have anarchy. And that's not what the data shows. The data does not show that you release these folks on these low level in Missouri, we're talking about C, D, and E felonies, and that the community falls apart. It's not supported by the numbers. It's just not. Uh, and that's something that you have to hold on to because I think we all can admit now that if you watch the news, the headlines or would tell you that the world is literally falling apart. Um, and, and I have to believe that that's not actually true and the numbers support that, that it's not true. Um, and, and so I think that's something important to remember, but also that these are people and most of them um, aren't, have not, like I said, pled guilty or been found guilty of the crime that they're alleged to have committed. And it is just an allegation. Um, and I think I, something I tell my clients when I meet with them early on is I'm not here to judge you. Uh, and I recognize that, but for maybe two or three decisions in my life, I'd be sitting behind the glass in, in a jumpsuit. There's very few differences between myself and some of my clients. Um, I'm someone's daughter, I'm someone's mom, all of those things, um, and so are they. So I, I, I understand the perception of we're just letting everybody out and the world's gonna fall apart. That's not supported in any data. You can't find data that shows that because it's not true. Ms. Mahaffey, you're in the city got all these people, gonna give them free money, free programs, free everything, and, and that's after they've done that. How do we, how do you, as a public defender, how do you work with that and still uh, push back against the notion of, you know, you're just gonna give them social work out of everything and all this money and all these free programs. How do we push back against that kind of a notion, please? Uh, I don't know if I'm going to push back on it, Shira. I might push back on your on on your on your question to me a little bit. Um, and obviously, Mr. Bell and, and Beverly and I will will probably fall in different places based on just what our mandates are to to accomplish here. But if you look at some of the the, the data from the Department of Justice, especially recently from the Vera Institute, um, it shows that I mean, and it, it's not universal. I agree with Beverly on that. But but for the for most most cases or incidents. I mean, you, you used murder one, which in Missouri has the only punishment available to it if you're over the age of, of you know, 18 is going to be life without prison. So that's a pretty extreme example, obviously. But for most cases, data would suggest that if you can engage with that individual in a meaningful alternative way, you will produce an outcome that is better than the traditional route of, 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 of what we think of criminal justice. So I do think that, and I will say I'm also biased because I am a, I have a master's in social work and I know Beverly's mom was a social worker for decades. Um, so I think there is a ma massive benefit for treating this differently than how we treat what I would say the health industry, which is we treat the health industry not as a preventative industry, but as an acute industry. You come in with a major problem and the issue that is underlying it wasn't talked about or addressed or, or prioritized, not by just the individual, but by society in general, to prevent that from happening. So I think the goal is twofold. Beverly is absolutely on point. Our role is we are representatives of our clients. We are not the leader. We are partnered with them. They are leading because it's their case. We don't have to do the time if something happens there. So we're being driven by our, our skills, hopefully as counselors with them, but for them to be self-determined in what the outcome wants to be. So we can't, part of us can't be as concerned with the bigger picture because each individual has to make that decision. But with regards to what we hope to see available to them, I would say I would love to see diversion options continue to expand to include the, the pop, those populations and those, those alleged those offenses that we have not included in the past. Um, you know, acknowledging Mr. Bell's rightful thing, like his job is to take into consideration community safety, and he needs to do that from the perspective he has. Our clients obviously are looking for ways to improve their lives and their specific position within the criminal legal system. And so we're, I mean, I'm on board with everything that we can do, and especially the ones that are being data driven. So you're saying that you're making the decision um, to work with this because it is a data driven decision rather than you just want to give free programs to people? I, I want, so <laughs> that's a great question. If a client says to Beverly or myself, that they would like us to see uh, us to explore something. Um, and it exists, right? It's not unethical for us to do it. We have a duty to do that, whether or not there is going to be strong evidence behind it. 
But when, when we're thinking, I think for me, when I'm thinking about bigger picture stuff that isn't the micro level representation of a client, I also want to be part of providing to the court, to the state, um, to society, as much evidence and data as we can to suggest here are outcomes we're seeing on these situations, which are different than what we've thought about the possible outcome would be so that we could expand it. And obviously, if the data is different, that it's going to be tough for us to use that. But I think right now, from what I'm seeing from places like Vera Institute, there is op there's, there's reason for optimism to start broadening who we include in these. I think it's also really important what Matthew's talking about. So, um, you know, in regards to criminal justice reform, we're just getting started, in my opinion. And there's a lot left to do. And so right now, some of what it's doing, it appears to be reactive, right? Someone gets charged or does something, and then we provide services. I think what the goal is, at least for me, I think, you know, for public defenders is eventually putting the work end on the front end to get these programs available, make them all free. I don't care. That's great. Because the goal is that people will not continue to engage in the criminal justice system. They won't be criminally justice involved anymore when we get these services out there. And that only benefits the community long term. So although it may seem a little front loaded right now, um, it should continue to be that way because if you start, if you create these programs, you set up the foundation and the network for it, um, and then you start to get people before they ever get involved in the criminal justice system. That's the goal. Right now, we're trying to catch up a little bit because criminal justice reform wasn't a thing 20 years ago. People didn't talk about it. Instead, it was punish, punish, punish. Um, and so right now, yeah, it may look like oh, we're just giving them everything. This is big picture. This is for our future. This is for what this community is going to look like in 20 years when the individuals that need help and that can be um, it can be recognized before a crime is committed, that the services are there. Uh, so why would we not put every single penny that we have into getting that set up uh, so that someday Matthew and I, I still want to be employed, but I'm okay. If I end up being employed in a different manner, I'm okay with that. Uh, if that means that our community is in a better um, in a better situation. And um, I want to jump in on that too because there's a lot to unpack in that question. It's a really good and interesting point. Um, and first, uh, to put some perspective on it, um, having worked on both sides, and I mean they know this as well. In in the criminal justice system, you need good people on both sides. Um, when, and, and when you have good people on both sides, um, you tend to get the more just outcomes. Now, on an individual case, we, we're gonna see it differently and we're gonna go at it and that's what we're supposed to do. Um, but on these broader issues, there is a lot of space for us to work together because I think we do all agree that there's a better way to do it. And so to the point of the law and order, I've never claimed to be um, a law and order prosecutor. As a matter of fact, Shira, I don't even know what that means. Um, it's just rhetoric. It's just it's just uh, empty language. Um, what we know is that if you want to if you want to try and give meaning to the law and order um, philosophy, then we have a whole generation uh, of case studies to look at, and we see the highest criminal, uh, the highest incarceration rates in the world. We've seen higher homicide rates, and so if you wanted. Um, uh, give credibility to the law and order philosophy. Well, what we've seen is that it doesn't work. And so um, as a former public defender, um, you have to keep in mind our roles are different. Um, uh, when you're a defense attorney, you have to represent the interests of your client. And that means if that person is charged and even they told you, hey, I'm guilty of murder, they still have a constitutional right to representation. And if we're going to put people in jail, we have to make sure that there are people that are standing there as safeguards to make certain that that individual, that that individual's rights are not abused. And, and, you know, maybe it's the difference in they not, you know, if they're innocent, they get out, but maybe they're guilty, but maybe there's some mitigating factors that instead of a life sentence, maybe something less. Um, so when I talk, when I look at myself as what I consider a progressive minded pro a prosecutor, to me, what that means is that we acknowledge that there are more tools in the toolbox than just incarceration. And 
a prosecutor is not, and, and uh, Judge Draper made this point in his uh, recent, um, in the recent ruling that came out with Lamar Johnson, disappointing, um, disappointing uh, conclusion, but, I, but there were some points that they made in there that he made specifically that I agree with. A prosecutor's role is not to just lock people up. A prosecutor's role is to seek justice. And if we determine that an individual just has a drug problem and, the, and they need help, then that's what justice looks like to me. And the last part to the cost, I think Bev made a very good uh, a point when, and to, to the point of the question of, well, making it free and giving them everything. What we find is that it costs somewhere in the range of 30 grand a year to incarcerate an individual. When we give them these types of, this type of treatment and access, we're saving ten to fifteen thousand dollars per individual. When we decrease, and that was when I say we, I mean uh, our population review team, all of our stakeholders, which includes Bev and the public defender's office. When we decrease the the jail population as high as thirty percent before COVID, and still now it's been decreased by sixteen percent, that saved the county millions of dollars. So the costs are not just long term. We're already seeing a savings in costs. Now, again, COVID has slowed us down because the, the criminal justice system has come to a halt. Judges are in a prob, at a, at a, at, in, a, in a bind because um, as both Matt and uh, Bev said, individuals that would be out because their case would have been resolved now are sitting there because they can't get a trial date. They can't get cases moved. And so that's causing a, a, a problem. But as far as costs, it, it costs less to give these types of alternatives. It saves taxpayer dollars, but most importantly, it helps people. And, and, and at the end of the day, that's where that's what is that's where I'm that's always my North Star. Does it help people? And that help means it helps families and all the collateral positive benefits that come with that. It is $87.50 a day to house someone in the St. Louis County Jail. It's more than that, Bev, actually. That's the estimated cost. No, there's an estimated cost when we did the research yeah. and, and that number's there, but there's so many other collateral costs right. that drive that that way over a hundred bucks per day, per individual. But yeah, it's it's it, the, the the cost saving is on the other end. If we give them diversion and we give them these alternatives to incarceration. And let me add this part, Bev. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, let me, but let me say this last part. What we've seen is that when you give individuals, when, when you keep people out of jail, they're less likely to go back. When we talk about putting people in jail makes them safer, we've seen the complete opposite. A short stay, a stay in jail increases the likelihood they're gonna come back. And so the diversion programs that you speak of, the population review, jail reductions, the people that we've given treated to have, given, have a, a recidivism rate of less than 6% as opposed to 70% across the country when we talk about recidivism rates. And I think what Wesley, so, and, and he's right, that 87.50 is the, is the bare minimum. If you're in the jail right. and you require nothing else, well, that's not what happens. <laughs> exactly, when healthcare, you're in jail, nothing. <laughs> yeah, when you, you need a Band-Aid, when you have a swollen this, a broken that, an extracted tooth, whatever, you're looking at well over $33,000 a year to house yep. someone in the jail that really might just need a better medication plan on the street, right? They hooked yep. up with BJC Behavioral Health, they get a better meds, you're never gonna see them again. And we also have to remember, every time someone steps foot in the jail, if they're there for 24 hours, 72 hours, eight months, what are we looking at on the community now? You've now lost your job, you've lost your housing, if you have children, where are your children? Who's taking care of them? Who's providing them that relationship that has now been taken away? Um, you're a member of your church. You're a member of, you know, you help take care. All of that sitting in the jail for 24 hours can affect every single one of those things. So getting people re-engaged in the community is critical to their success long-term and to the long-term success of that community. Thank you. And I appreciate you unpacking it and doing things. What I'm trying to do is make sure that this faith community understands 
sort of what people are saying so that they can have the mm -hmm. correct information and the tools they need to have intelligent conversation. And sometimes that is not always available to us. And I wanted to make sure that I couched it in the ways that it's coming to people so that you can answer it in a way that makes sense to the people who are listening. Um, Sarah, I'll say this, not only do we know, not only do we know what you're doing, we appreciate what you're doing, but the answer is you're going to get some passionate responses, but no, we appreciate it. <laughs> no, no and, and I appreciate you all. How do we, so there's this mindset that it sounds like we have to change in order. So because truthfully, because I have a master's in social work too, um, truthfully, information about recidivism has been literally for decades since I've been in school with a master's in social work, and that was over 20 years ago. That information has been readily available, easily digested. Uh, people have composed a prose and poetry about it, and it still has not penetrated the masses to understand the cost associated. So when you do a cost benefit analysis, the benefits of uh, certain programs substantially overwhelmingly outweigh the costs. And when you're looking at recidivism, right, the benefits of the program substantially outweigh the costs and, and the recidivism is lower with that population, yet it hasn't penetrated, yet it hasn't been uh, superbly embraced. We're going to sort of lock us, you know, some people believe we can, you know, lock you up and punish you and, 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 and that ought to teach, that ought to learn you. How do we work with people and how do we, what barriers do you see that need to be removed? And then my second question is, how would you recommend this group, this people of faith to talk about them or to work with them to remove those barriers so that people understand what can happen and what we should do about it? I'll start with you first, Wesley. Um, I think there's a lot of things that people can do. And, and one of the things is we, uh, I think we sent you a, uh, a, uh, a list of ways that we would suggest people getting involved. Um, and I, hopefully you can share that um, with, with the listeners today. Uh, but I just think there's a lot that we can do. One, we have to get, we have to continue to be available at these types of, in these types of settings so we can spread the message. And then we need the individuals listening to spread it within their spheres of influence. Um, one thing that we were um, fortunate to receive uh, is the LEAD grant, which is the Law, Enf Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Grant, uh, which is all about uh, working with law enforcement to keep people out of jail, educating in uh, departments, and, and right now we're working with two very diverse departments, Afton and, and uh, Jennings, um, to, to teach officers and show them the different ways that we can, um, um, that, that we can get individuals to, to the help that they need without locking them up. And that includes bringing social workers. We hired the first social worker um, in, our, in the history of this office, but the LEAD grant has now allowed us to hire two more social workers to connect individuals with uh, these sources. And so I think that in addition to those, those, those things that we talked about, I think it's important to understand the why behind what we're doing. And that's why these kind of settings are so important. We talk about our policies, but it's important for you to be able to ask these tough questions so we can talk about you know, why we're doing these things and, and, and the reasoning behind it. Because what I found out, what I find out is not just in North and Mid County where you expect to see more people open to it. When I go out to West County um, and talk to individuals who, who you, you would think are not inclined toward criminal justice reform and, and talk to them about the, what the data shows us, what the research shows us and how it impacts them and how it impacts family members, they're getting on board. So, I think it's just a matter of us getting the message out. And that's why I'm appreciative of opportunities like this to talk about. It. Mr. Mahaffey, what do we need to do to remove some of the barriers to getting this information to the public, in your opinion? I tend to think that what we're doing right now is an enormous starting point. Um, and, and I. I guess knowing that like Beverly and I go to church across the street from one another, um, I think about the faith communities that we're both part of, which are 
kind of tied together in many ways. And the conversations that have that, that we have there and maybe some of the struggles and pushes we have with each other there. And I think it, to, for me, it starts at that level. Are you engaging as an individual with the, the, the individuals that are in your circle of people, right? Because I think Wesley made a great point when he was talking earlier and it, it just triggered in my mind, the thought that we tend to protect our own. I mean, sure, you asked a good question about why haven't we seen the data that you've seen since you've been in social work school. I, I graduated in 2005. It's the same stuff that I was being presented and it has very slowly expanding. I think Beverly was right to say we're at the beginning, right? So how come it hasn't been faster? Are we expanding the circles that we're talking with? Are we, are we also taking risks and being courageous in when and how we present that information? Are we taking opportunities like this to engage, even though we know that there might be some pushback and there might be some challenges that come with it? And are we doing that consistently with our friends, our colleagues, our adversaries, and our communities? If the answer is yes, then that will grow organically in a way that I think is sustainable. If we're expecting it to come from our traditional power structures, I would suggest that those exist to protect themselves. And we've seen that. I mean, how long did it take for a person of color to get elected in the prosecutor's position in the city of St. Louis and in the in St. Louis County? Um, it's, it's designed to insulate itself and be that. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us who are trying to think differently about it to make sure that we are engaging with that thought process in, in every aspect of our lives. Well, and I think, you know, we're here and we're, ha we're talking about having a real conversation, right? And, and some of these conversations uncomfortable are uncomfortable. So let's be uncomfortable. The reason that the data hasn't gotten out there, the reason that the community as a whole hasn't supported it is because for the last 30 years, it only applied to young black men, right? It was only black men that were doing these things. It was only young black men that were these big, bad, scary criminals that were messing up the community by robbing people and killing people and on drugs, scary black men. That's not accurate, okay? And, that, and, 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 and I think anyone engaging in this conversation and willing to have that uncomfortable conversation and say, well, wait a minute, that is not an accurate description of what's been happening. And now we're throwing the data in people's faces to say, wait a minute, look at this. It's white, white individuals, Asian Americans, Latino, like pick, pick one. This isn't, um, this isn't just a certain race that is, that, that is committing crime, but the perception and what we are seeing when we talk about arrests is that it still falls down to the people of color population, that those are the ones sitting in the jail, right? That's the majority of the folks in there. And until we get past that hump, until we're willing to sit around in a group of people and say, why is that? Why? Why, why are we looking at more black people in jail than white people? Then, then none of this is going to move forward. It's, it's, it's just not. And so this starts that. And, you know, our country has gone through a lot in the past year. Um, much of it very tragic. Out of those tragedies come conversations and um, come a willingness to see yourself, right? We've been talking about people that want to protect their own. You start to see yourself in that situation or you see your son maybe going down the wrong path or whatever it may be. And that's, that's the momentum that we have to build on because that's when people get engaged is when they see themselves in that situation. Um, and we don't want anyone to be part of the criminal justice system, but I most certainly want you to realize that you could be, you really could be, something bad can happen. And now let's talk about if it were you, protected, you know, safe little haven of a place, nothing bad ever happens, and now something has. What, what happens? Do we throw away the key and put you in prison? I hope not. I hope we do the same thing for you that we would for someone else, which is, look at the services and look at what you really need. So it's uncomfortable and people have to just say it, right? You just have to say it. Black people are in jail. Black people are in prison at numbers significantly more than any other race. Thank you and thank all of you. I'm gonna to go to uh, Christine Dragonette. She has the questions that are in the chat and, and gonna make sure that we get the questions from the people who are here with us to uh, answer. Christine? Yes, thanks, Shira. Um, first, I would just direct everyone um, to the question and answer 
feature where you can see that some of the questions are being uh, answered by text. Thank you, Mr. Mahaffey, for being attentive to that. Um, I'll get to the couple questions that are maybe lingering from there. But first, we have quite a few questions around this idea of restorative justice. Um, the first one, there's a couple that are related. Someone asked, is there support for the restorative justice initiatives from other state and local elected officials? If so, who might that be? And or what does that look like? And someone else asked, um, I assume this is St. Louis City, which mayoral candidate will better support restorative justice? I, I, I wanna tackle the first one. I'm, I, I'm respectfully to the person that asked the second one, I'm not going on record there. Um, uh, the, but to the first question, and I'd love to hear too what Beverly and, and Wesley have to say. Um, yesterday on NPR, if people, if anyone heard at noon, they did a, a talk about the public defender's funding system. Um, and it was interesting because the person on there, there was the head of the ACLU, and then there was a Republican representative from O'Fallon. And they were pretty much on the same page most of the time. Uh, and I think part of the the answer around restorative justice and these ideas that we could have alternatives to incarceration, there's some common ground here amongst people that sometimes you might not think have it. Um, because the representative from O'Fallon was thinking about it from a money standpoint too. Like as, as Wesley and Beverly pointed out, the, the data suggests we're gonna save money if we are looking for ways to reduce incarceration. And that's that was music to this guy's ears. And obviously the ACLU was looking at it more from their perspective too, make, making sure we give quality representation for people, which is, I think Beverly would agree with me, it's much easier to provide creative and engaged representation with someone when they're not incarcerated. Because if the only thing a judge ever sees from someone when, from their time of engagement is this person as an incarcerated individual and they never have a chance to see what they are like as a non-incarcerated person other than the, what you can tell them about their history, it makes it harder to have to, for that person to be their humanity to be lifted. So I think, I think there's grounds here for us to agree that restorative justice is a place that we can develop and would be beneficial to both, I guess, political ideologies for lack of a better term. And I, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about both of them. I'll go on record and talk about both questions. Um, and the first one is, I wanna make sure that we, uh, when, when I'm given some context that when I'm at, when, when we're having a discussion, uh, you know, about politics, it can be, we know it can be very divisive. And so what I'm about to say is there is a distinction between a, a citizen out there who identifies with the Republican Party. That's not who I'm talking about. I'm talking about um, Repu Republican leadership in Missouri currently. Now, there, it is true, Matt, it's absolutely correct that there has been some uh, common ground, and there has been some um, push on both sides by um, um, by elected officials in Jeff City. However, the overwhelming majority of that push is coming from Democrat leadership, um, Republican leadership. We get some push, you know, some um, cooperation, but in many ways, we come to a just a complete halt, particularly particularly when it comes to police reform. Um, you cannot get a police reform, even if it's a reasonable police reform. And again, my father is a retired police officer. Many friends are police officers. I have the utmost respect for law enforcement. That said, I think that just like if any of us do anything wrong, we're going to be held accountable. I think everyone should be held accountable. And when you uh, try to get a um, any kind of police reform bill out of committee, are, are, are to the floor to vote, you're never gonna get it out of committee um, uh, because the, the police reform committee is filled with ex-officers, officers wives, officer lobbyists. So you're never, it's never gonna see the light, light of day. And so um, if we're gonna have an honest conversation, we gotta say, yeah, we know that there are many Republicans. Shamed Dogan is a Republican who is big on criminal justice reform, but by and large, um, I don't know many Democrats at all that are not for it, but I can name a lot of Republican leaders. And I'm, this is not taking a shot at residents and citizens. We're talking about elected officials. Uh, the second question with respect to the mayoral election in St. Louis City. Um, I, I, I know uh, one of them a little. I've met her. She seems like a very nice individual. I know Tashara very well and I've had conversations with her 
about restorative justice. So I know based on conversations that I've had that she is actually even initiated at times that she is um, an advocate for restorative ju justice practices. Um, and I know that's something that she will join and talk about, not just in the city and working with um, uh, Circuit Attorney Gardner, but even regionally. And those are the conversations that we had have been having is that we know that we have to start looking more regionally. And that's one of the things that we, I have actually had a conversation with her uh, myself about on that particular topic. But that's not to take a shot at the other person. I don't, we're not doing that. I'm just saying that I know uh, based on conversations that I've had directly with Tishara Jones, that that's something that is um, um, on, on her agenda, if you will. I don't think I have much to add. They really covered that, didn't they? <laughs> well, in that case, I'll, I'll keep going with these questions around restorative justice. Um, there's a few more. One, one person wrote, and I hope this is okay that I'm outing her here. It was Kathy McGinnis with the Institute for Peace and Justice. And she said that she really supports restorative justice work and works with a lot of ex-offenders. Can you give us a concrete example of how restorative justice works for a victim of a crime? And I'll ask another question at the same time, just to make it easier. Someone else asked, how are our police forces being engaged in the restorative process? I don't know if that was for me. I don't, I don't see any, okay. I'll, it I'll was go directed ahead to anyone who would like to take it. Yes. Um, so I, I think did, you're best uh, situated. I think you're best situated to answer that, Leslie. <laughs> Fair, but, you know, interestingly enough, I'm gonna cite an example when I was a public defender. Uh, um, when I was a PD, uh, we had the special public defender's office and to Matt's point earlier, that um, office was shut down because of budget, um, uh, because the budget was that, that's been continually taken away from the public defender's office, which that's another thing I'm on record for is that we need to get them fully funded. Um, and so the juvenile court uh, uh, was one of my assignments when I worked at the special public defender's office. And the, the juvenile courts are, are, are very much um, um, doing uh, things, you know, they're about rehabilitation, but also restorative justice, bringing a defendant when a, a defendant, uh, a, a kid, I should say in this particular example, but also victims into the same room when the victim wants to and having these conversations. And, and I've, I've, I've just seen a conversation of uh, situation where a kid had, uh, broken into uh, this this gentleman's uh, this family's car, assaulted the husband, and that family agreed to come in and 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 have this this restorative justice session. And and I'm telling you, after they uh, were talking to that young man about how he impacted them, and when they heard about um, the what this young man had been dealing with in his life. I mean, sexual abuse and all these things that got him to this place. It, I mean, it, it literally was not a dry eye in the house and everyone left that feeling that justice had been served even though the kid was not being locked up or sent any, anywhere. And the victims in, in this case even signed off on it. Um, um, as well as the, 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 the kid had an opportunity to uh, do community service and actually pay for the damage to the car. Um, and even that was a, gave a sense of empowerment that, hey, I messed up, but I, I was held to account and I, and I did it. So, I mean, that's one example of, of what you see and uh, of, of, of the potential that uh, we've seen. And then I'll, and one last example, because they have more resources in, in DC, uh, the Attorney General's office in D.C. under, uh, and his name slipped my mind, a uh, good friend of mine, and it'll come to me, they they have the funding for a full restorative justice unit uh, with, with, I think, 15 to 20 people in that unit. And they, they look at all types of situations where they bring people in regularly and work out the types of stuff that in our region is just um, prosecute and keep it moving. Um, and, and they've seen the, uh, a very uh, positive benefit and recidivism rates and just the feeling of, of justice being served by, by individuals who uh, have gone through that. And, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, but this was a good question. Last thing and I promise. Um, 
And when we talk about victims and defendants, I want to make sure we, 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 um, I make this point. Sometimes we hear the argument that, hey, well, sounds like you're only dealing with, you're only working for defendants and you don't care about victims. But, you know, and one of my prosecutors, when I first came in, brought this up and I asked her, look at your, Bev, you know this person, look at your caseload and look at the victims in your case. Look at, um, um, look at their arrest records because many of our victims have also been defendants. And many of our defendants are or will be victims. So when you help this population, you're helping everybody. Thank you. Um, Matt, that's your fault. You teed that one up for me. <laughs> we have a lot of questions coming in, so I'll just keep going if that's okay with everyone. Um, Another question on a little bit of a different, the diversion note. Um, someone asked if um, a person with a substance use disorder commits a crime, what options are available to that person? Do they need a sponsor who helps keep them accountable or are there housing programs? How does that work? I feel like I'm talking too much. So I <laughs> Unless somebody tells me, I'm going to let Bev or Matt jump in there first. I think that's a good one for you to start, Wesley. I can tell you <laughs> some things that we've seen that have been helpful, but you've championed the programs in the county. So, uh, you know, I'll let you roll with that one. Matt, are you signing off on this, sir? <laughs> uh, I, can, I can talk about the city just briefly um, oh, and, yeah. then, and then let you do that too. Sure, that, that's, that's great. Um, I think part of the question for so, so Christine, can you please repeat the question just so I make sure I answer it and not go off? Yes. Um, when someone with, oh, I just deleted it here. Um, someone with a substance use disorder commits a crime, um, what options are available for that individual and how are they held accountable, basically? So uh, I'll start with the first part, the options and then the accountability. The, the, in the city, um, Kim's office has done a, a really good job. I will give her credit on this. Uh, very much so in developing different levels of engagement with people whose primary issue that she, her, her staff feels are, are substance related. And one of those issues has been to try to get some, I guess, education and information to that person, sometimes pre-charge, sometimes pre-conviction. Um, and if that engagement happens, then those cases resolve themselves. Um, so that's, I think that's one way that the, the circuit attorney's office in the city is engaging with it. There's a lot of community organizations, obviously, that provide substance stuff, but I think of important note on the accountability question part. In society, there's a, some people may have heard this adage, there's a, an adage that if you are of privilege and have a substance use issue, you have a medical problem. If you are not of privilege and you have a substance use issue, you have a legal problem. And I think that's a framework we need to start thinking about more. Like, why are we treating people differently for the exact same manifestation? Um, and I, I think that's part of why Kim has started to roll this out, which is, you know, we can't we can't be having this two two types of societies in terms of how we view the use of substances, um, because that's kind of how we've led to, as, as Wesley accurately said, if you, the drug laws have led to a lot of where we are right now. Um, and I would say that's, you know, there, there's some things that we're doing well regionally. And I would say in the city and the county, that's something that we're doing well. Um, to Beth's point earlier, still got more to do, but that's something that we're doing well. And so in our office, no, you do not need a sponsor. As a matter of fact, if we are aware of it and catch it, you don't even need a defense attorney. Um, we are, there, there are different types of, um, of diversion and you have um, all the alternative courts, which are under um, the guidance of the, the judiciary, the judge. So. Um, people who are charged with a crime and, and it's been determined that this type of treatment is better for them, but something that we've implemented as well as uh, Matt pointed out that uh, Kim Gardner has implemented in the city is pre-charge diversion. And, 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 and it's key for, I think it's important to point the difference, point out the difference is that we know what happens if you get a conviction on your record. It's hard to get a job. It's hard, all the collateral consequences that go with that. But there's another one that pops up for a lot of people. And I think a lot of us know about this is that your arrest record. When you get charged, if you just get charged with something, um, many employers are finding out about that and it is inhibiting people from getting jobs. And so 
Um, that's why we implemented, um, when, it, when appropriate, pre-charge diversion. So we catch it uh, before that individual is charged and give them directly to some type of treatment program. Now, sometimes you got to, and I'm just going to use an example, a 20-year-old kid who gets caught with a small amount of drugs is determined that they don't really need treatment. They just made, they were just stupid. So then we might send them to an educational class where they can just learn about their stupidity, if you will. Uh, but then there's some people that we realize have a larger, a more serious substance use um, issue or mental health issue. And so what we did was we created our, our diversion advisory committee that has now grown to over 40 partners. And um, those partners are, are our uh, stakeholders that offer different types of services. Because one thing that we know um, is that judges, when you say, and I'm gonna use a quick example, someone with mental, uh, that is having mental health episodes, that person is more likely to reoffend than someone who doesn't, obviously. And sometimes judges are looking at individuals, for example, with a mental health um, issue, that man, if I, if I let this person out, they're gonna come back on something more serious and it's not gonna be beneficial. So a judge feels like, okay, maybe I should just keep them until something else comes along. Well, by having this advisory committee and having these resources at hand, ready to go, we can say, judge, we have a place that we can send this individual. For example, places for people or affinia with their substance use program and all these things are free. But also we know that part of treatment is having adequate housing. A person that doesn't have housing is more likely to relapse. A person that doesn't have a job is more likely to relapse. So included in our partners are how, um, organizations that offer access to housing, organizations like the Urban League that offer access to jobs and job training, and you name it. If we don't have it, we're trying to get it so that we can offer individualized care for these individuals because, because when we give them these this, this uh, this, the, the, this treatment, this support goes back to that number I talked about before of the thousand or so people that we've treated since we created our diversion program. Again, the recidivism rate is less than 6%. So these things work and, and I'm not gonna take credit like I invented these things. No, we followed the data. We looked at other communities that were doing these things and then we created something that was customized for, for St. Louis County, but still the same idea, give people support, they thrive. And that's what we're, going to do and continue to do. I think I would just follow up on that and say, you know, some of the, um, it's nice to hear some of that information from Wesley because those pre-charge, pre-charge cases, don't know about them. They don't come to us and I'm perfectly fine with that. <laughs> that is a good thing. We, we're, we're good. We're, we're maxed out. We don't need to, we don't need to know about it. And we hope that those things continue because that really is quite helpful. You hear a lot about, you know, well, it's on my record, you know, and they're like, I want my record cleared. Pre-charge diversion is something that can really address that issue um, because, again, Wesley's right, when you get arrested, there is an arrest record. And even if, um, you know, your case gets dismissed or you get found not guilty, whatever it may be, that's still sitting there and employers will find it and employers will refuse to hire you. They might come up with another reason, but it's because they saw that arrest uh, from, you know, whatever it was. So those are fantastic programs. Something that we think we are finding some success with in the county as well is the alternative courts. Um, they're, they, they, you know, I think from the past maybe four to five years, they've been gearing up. Uh, the past two years, they've ramped up a lot more. But here in St. Louis County, we have an alternative court for veterans, for um, uh, drug, uh, DWI court. DWI. We have drug court. We have mental health court. Um, we have domestic violence. So we've tried to, to categorize things um, in some of the five major areas that we are seeing offenses come in. And from a defense standpoint, you know, if my client is charged with one of those crimes, um, I can take that case to, to Wesley's office and say, look, here are some external reasons that you may not be aware of that aren't in the police report, right? They're not in the arrest record um, that talk about why my client would be a good candidate for DWI court or for, for mental health court. And once we get them into that program, although it is under the supervision of the court, right? There's still criminally justice, criminal justice involved. But once we get them into that program, that is hooking them up with, like Wesley said, ADAPT, BJC Behavioral Health, Places for People. I mean, there's so many different organizations 
um, and making sure that they can get a job, that they can manage their medications, that they can live independently. Um, and, and those are things that we need to continue and we need to push. I will say housing is one of the biggest struggles that we face, um, making sure someone has stable, reliable housing. It's, it's not prevalent in St. Louis area. If you are poor and you can't afford a place, you don't have a lot of options. Um, and so whenever we can find an organization that can assist in that, um, or um, that it, it is incredibly helpful uh, for our clients, but that is one of our biggest, biggest barriers. Services for the medical issue, like Matthew was describing, right? The medical need, the mental health need, the substance abuse needs, um, those, are, those are amping up and those are becoming more available but housing is, is difficult. Thank you. I wanna raise up um, Father Rodney who offered our opening prayer has a question that Mr. Mahaffey has addressed um, and offered some thoughts in the chat, but wanted to raise it to Ms. Haber and Mr. Bell. And if you have anything to say you know, out loud as well. Um, he said he lives and ministers here at the Rock Church on the North side. He believes and supports restorative justice. However, this needs the essential justice infrastructure in order for restorative justice to work. What do the people who live, <clears throat> excuse me, who live on the north side of the Del Mar wall do to create infrastructure needed? Mr. Maffey, can you share the answer that you gave with, with everybody? And then if anybody wants to chime in, just so that people know. Sure, what sure. I just, I didn't think it was an adequate answer. So it was why I wanted it to be brought to Wesley and Beverly as well. I, I mean, I, I, may, I am truly excited about what, what Mike Milton is going to bring because his, his, his community, his Freedom Community Center is going to be on the north side, but it's but one place, right? And the question is, how do we get funds to flow that way? And my, my, my answer to, to Father was, People with the with the resources have to care about both the idea of restorative justice and that community. So I, my answer was that political involvement seems like we've got to push politicians that have access to those funds to get them that way. But I think that that's a weak answer, and that I imagine those communities have tried that for decades and have been unsuccessful because they don't have the the money that that entity wants to see present in order to do what they're asking. I think it goes back to, I think, I mean, I think Matthew hits it on the head, unfortunately, and we don't like to hear this, but so much of this comes down to money. And um, this is something that we discussed a little bit earlier is, and, and it's hard for people to commit to this, but you got to front load some of this stuff to get the result on the back end. So how do we convince the folks with the resources and the legislator to put the money in now? Say, so put it in, because if you put this money in, we are going to see, we're going to reap the benefits of the reward, right? Like just takes time. Um, and, and I don't have a good answer for how to, to get them on board, how to get them to follow the data that we've been talking about has existed for 30 years um, and how to get them to care about every member of our community, not just some. Um, I, I wish I had a good answer for that, but um, Unfortunately, I think a lot of it initially comes down to money and also comes down to something else we talked about earlier is seeing yourself within the problem. Is that um, I think in the in the father's questions, you know, he specifically started stated right the north side of the Del Mar wall. Well, if you're not on that north side of the Del Mar wall, then there must not be a problem. Right. I think some people really can choose to put those blinders up and we know that that's not accurate um, and that that's not how it should work. But I think for some folks, it does, and that and that creates a that's a problem. It's just a problem. And and I would I would uh, echo uh, both of their uh, their answers, and um, but also add that um, you know much of what happens that this question is getting at happens upstream of the criminal justice system. By the time that they come to my office, by the time they're um, applying for a public defender, uh, much of the damage has been done. Not, not that they're not, we can't still help them, we can, but much of what you're getting at in this question it has been done. And so that's why it's important to me to not only talk about criminal justice reform and, and the reason why we need to push this narrative, but also 
to use my platform to try and help those, those things upstream. So you'll see us involved with the Urban League and food and food drives and, and working with St. Louis Diaper, I think it's Diaper Association, giving out diapers to, to young parents who can't afford them, um, um, advocating for early, more funding for early childhood education because we know about the pipeline to prison. Um, and so, yeah, there's no easy answer, but I think for, for all of us, we all have an influence some of it smaller, some of it larger. And we got to use that, the influence that we do have to push for these things. And the, uh, the, the, uh, and Shira, did you get our, um, our uh, ways to get involved document? I did not, but what we do have, because we send something out every week, but what we do have is a way to send them to the attendees after because it, it, you have awesome. to register for it. And so if any any of the three of you want to offer something, we can certainly send it to the attendees. And then if they, uh, if anybody else comes in or does anything, we always, we, it, we can make it available to others as well. And so um, we'll get that and I appreciate that. And so just, you know, there's 10 things that we sent, but a couple things that I just want to say are um, one, um, writing letters to the editor, small stuff like that, especially an organization like this and members to talk about how important these issues are, because that starts putting pressure on other elected officials and other stakeholders and the people that Bev and Matt talked about who have the money. But also criminal justice reform has to be a voting priority. If you're, going, if you're going to vote and this is like your fourth or fifth priority, then guess what? We're not gonna move the needle. Um, I can't think of anything more important than um, to, vote, to, to vote for than individuals' freedom and, 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 and having the rights that we all should have um, uh, that were discussed earlier. And so those are just two of the things that, we, that we'll, we'll get to you all to get out. Uh, but um, I think those are two important things to start with. Well, and I'll say, you know, um, I think Wes is right, right? Getting getting to the folks that um, allocate the resources. They need to be pushed to uh, reconsider how they're going to do that. And uh, Matthew mentioned an NPR piece yesterday uh, where they were talking about funding for the public defender's office. And like I said earlier, as much as Matthew and I would like to be unemployed, um, we, we are employed and, and there's a need for the work that we do. Um, but it costs money. You have to pay people um, and you have to have the funding to hire people. And that those decisions, like Wesley said, are made upstream. And those folks need to hear from their constituents that this matters to them, that criminal justice reform matters to them, um, guaranteeing that people have their constitutional right to an attorney matters and that it needs to be, it needs to be funded. I think there was a question, and I apologize, Christine, if you're going to get to this, there was um, a question about representation by the public defender's office versus uh, private counsel. And, you know, that's something that we deal with all the time, right? It's, not, it's, it's a daily statement of, well, I'm going to go hire a real lawyer. Okay. Um, that's, that's an interesting statement. Uh, <laughs> and, and I think anyone in the public defender's office response is generally, well, I am a real lawyer. I went to the same law school as every other person. I, you know, I took the same bar exam as, as Truett and Wesley. We, we all took the same bar exam, so we're all uh, real lawyers. But it's it's also so much about the language that we use, right? And I think that that's something else that you really have to talk to uh, when you're in a in a community setting and your friends and family. Defendants, public defenders versus attorneys. Um, you know, assuming guilt, allegations, right? Jail versus prison. All of these terms actually do mean something and they're all can be different except that public defender lawyer thing. That one's the same. Um, but um, they, they're different and they have value. And so learning about that and talking about that. Um, I see in the chat, are public defenders state funded? Yes, we are um, employed by the state of Missouri. There is a public defender commission um, that is involved in that, but yeah, we are, we are state funded and they are looking at their budget right now to see, um, what is going to happen next. So talk to your legislators. Um, we are state funded and we are underfunded significantly. 
Thank you. We have um, a two part question here. Um, you may have touched on pieces of this already, but just to make sure um, to address all the parts of this question, how do you ensure that people who are offered restorative justice engage in the programs they are offered and show up for their appointments so that they can benefit from their programs? Also, how do you identify people who need to be offered these programs before they commit a crime? Um, I'm a I'm a process oriented person, and so I, I I think that you set up sound processes, and then you make certain that you are adhering to those processes. And so, um, when we we have a victim services unit, and so we we are very um, deliberate about um, our contact with the, with with victims, as well as you know, if in, in a in a situation like this where a that means the, the 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 individual charged as well as their if they have an attorney have agreed to be a part of this process so we make certain that they are they understand the process well first we make sure that they agree everyone is on board but we make sure that they understand it and then it's about um, um following up and that part that's the easier part because keep in mind um you know we have victims advocates that are um and, and who are really invested in this type of work. So when they get an opportunity to deal with a case and they know, hey, we're not gonna send this person to jail, we're gonna help this person. I mean, that's motivation for, for those individuals. And so that's the easy part and identifying them, you know, that that's trickier. And I think that we have to open up the ways um, that we um, identify these cases. If we just say, hey, when our office sees a case that we think is eligible, we're gonna miss a lot of cases. And so, you know, we encourage defense attorneys, public defenders, um, private citizens to, to make that request with, with our office. We may not, may not always agree, but we're open to those recommendations. And we've had um, recommendations from defense counsel, public defenders on, an, on, an, on, an, on numerous things that we've looked at. Um, so I, I think, create a process, make sure that you're working that process, be flexible to change because things are gonna always come up, um, but then, and then also be open to the, to the ways that you identify these cases and err on the side of more than less. Any other responses to that question? No, I mean, I, I think Wes had, uh, covered it well. I mean, the best thing you can do is make the expectation clear, make the make the process clear as to how you get through it. And like I said earlier, we often see folks that they want to, to improve their life situation um, and giving them the option to do that often uh, creates engagement and involvement. So um, I, I can speak personally from my clients is that um, once, once you get them started, and show them what the end result can be, uh, they stay engaged. This is something that they want. Thank you. Um, another question that came in was around the challenge of how soon can we see positive results from restorative justice since leadership comes and goes and we'll end up feeling the harsh effects of, or the effects of harsher justice me measures. So this is a, uh, this is a, oh, sorry, sorry, Wesley, you wanna jump in? No, no, you go. Just quickly, this is something um, we've been working in the city on and just with some other funding possibilities for opportunities within the public defender office. And I think it's an answer sometimes that people don't like to hear, especially as we become even more of a hot now culture, which is everything is available within seven seconds. And we wanna see results within 30 after those seven seconds happen. I mean, it, it, I think there's an immediate benefit to the people engaged in those. Like, so like a complaining witness and, a, and an accused individual coming together on an agree, under an agreement with support systems, that is a, there's an immediate benefit there. But from a dollars and statistical standpoint, if you're looking at studies that have done it, they usually go out two, three, four years to evaluate the data so that they can have enough to see like, Put, put, put tangible numbers, not just, yeah, we saved $200 in this case or whatever it is. So part of the hard, the part, the hard part of the sell for a lot of people is you, you can't give someone like after a week, you can expect this kind of decrease in crime. 
with a restorative justice program. It's going to happen, but it's going to take time, just like it's taken 400 years for us to build the system that we have right now, which continues to process and incarcerate black and brown people. So I think, I don't say patience in a negative way, but I think we have lost patience um, as we've been able to access everything immediately in society. And we need to remember that change in both individuals and is, is slow and how much more so for structures. Um, you know, I, I, I think both of them have kind of hit the, the, the nail on the head. Um, many of these restorative justice practices are already being implemented um, in many ways. When, we, when we're looking at um, diversion that, that's happening in the city as well as in the county, many of those um, um, underlying, have underlying restorative justice practice components, if you will. Um, but as you know, Matt and Bev both pointed out, if you wanna see more broad uh, restorative justice clinics and things of that nature that we're looking into, yeah, we're gonna need we're gonna need the funding. The problem is we created a conviction incident review unit to look at um, um, allegations of wrongful conviction, but also that same Waldorf unit deals with cases involving police malfeasance or police use of force. We didn't get any extra budget for that. We had to take from other air, from other units that we still needed, and repurpose those positions that we still needed over to create this unit. We didn't get budget for an extra diversion unit. We had to take positions, um, already established positions, repurpose them and uh, create a uh, diversion team. And so for over a year, we have one person um, in, in that unit, one full-time person, and then she shared a secretary. Now we've been able to expand that, but by the same formula, we've had to take other positions. And so, you know, in some ways we've had to rob Peter to pay Paul, um, but it's a priority for us. We think that it's, that it's important. And, and so that's why we, we've done it. Now that said, if we're gonna take the next step, and I love the fact that everyone is asking about restorative justice. I, I, I think that's just a testament to the, um, the, the, the group that's, that's on here. And I appreciate that. But if we're gonna take that next step and start to continue this work, we're going to need the resources at some point. I can't keep pulling away from other trial units or from other, um, other uh, particular departments in my office, we're going to need the budget uh, to, to in, in, in order to uh, expand those types of programs. That said, I will say this, even if we don't get it, we're gonna move forward. It's just, it, it just goes to the question of how soon. Thank you. Um, this next question involves an acronym that I am not familiar with, but I assume you all will be. Um, this person is asking if you can speak to the MIP program and how you all might support them or partner with them. And if someone could, uh, could share what the MIP program is, that would be great. Is that an acronym that you all are familiar with? I don't know what it is. Um, the person who asked the question, Mike Jarvis, um, are we talking about the the um, the misdemeanor? It's a misdemeanor intervention program. I've heard of that. Is that the MIP they're referring to? I always thought it was a minor in possession. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a thing too. Well, maybe we can come back to that if we get more clarity. Um, that person wants to share in the chat, and and it sounds like that might not be a question that you all can address right now, uh, but feel free to circle back to it. Um, someone asked if we can report, well, this is very specifically asking if we can report on the news, um, but maybe just in general, the numbers and cases where restorative justice have worked for both the offender and the victim. It only works if it works for both. I would say that, like that's the design right. of the system, right? It can't It can't just work for one, otherwise that that's, restorative justice hasn't happened. I don't have access to data on that because I, I, I just don't, I could try to look for it, but I, I did want to clarify that in the question. And I, and I would also say, keep in mind, um, you know, I've been in office two years, Kim's I've been in office four years and both of us have um, working with our partners, uh, many of which are on this panel um, we have been working to implement a lot of things. And, you know, unfortunately, Rome wasn't built in the day and we're not going to be able to, 
to implement everything in a day. Now that said, we have been implementing restorative justice practices, but as we um, as we continue, I know that's in the that's a priority for all of us to um, to 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 you know to create something more robust um, with respect to criminal justice. But also understand one of the main challenges is that, um, and I think Matt made this point a few minutes ago, is that everyone has to be on board in order to. Um, to, you know, for a respective case to move forward in, in restorative justice. And oftentimes victims of crime don't want to do it. And we've had several situations where we have offered it and our victims are like, this person robbed me or this person assaulted me. I don't want to see them again. And we can't force them to do that. And then there's even times a few defendants have said, we, you know, I don't want to do it. Um, so that, that those are some of the challenges, but um, and I, I feel like, you know, I know we're repeating ourselves because this question comes up, but I think it's a really good question is that that is something that is a priority for all of us. Um, that's something that we're going to continue to work toward. Um, there are some challenges, there are some things that we're going to need in order to fully effectuate it, but it, it is definitely something that is a priority and, and then that we know will, will benefit all involved. Well, and I think there was also, um, something also to that, you know, it's, it's not enjoyable to watch the news most days, right? You watch the news and it's some horrific crime. You know, just yesterday, obviously there was uh, a great tragedy in St. Louis County um, with a family and you watch these things and, um, and it's, it's sad and it's unnerving. And it would be nice if we could get more of the positive out, right? For every, for every tragic story like that, it would be great to show three positives and three changes that have happened. Um, and and I, I hope that someday the news starts to take that shift a little bit. But that's also a difficult challenge too, especially um, for our clients. You know, um, they want to improve their lives, they want to to make a difference, and they want to move on. It's um it's a lot to kind of be the the poster child for some of these programs. Uh, and I think when opportunities, I can speak for myself, when opportunities for my clients to maybe get their story out a little bit and talk about how they've changed, there's been often hesitation on their part because they're not proud of um, what got them in that situation. They're very proud of the work they've done um, in improving it. But to, um, to put yourself out there in that regard, I think is sometimes difficult uh, for people, especially when they've put in all the hard work to move on. And Shira, if I could add too, because this group clearly is is a uh, um, supportive of restorative justice practices. I don't know if this is one of the topics that you're going to be covering, but you know, there's a couple people that I would recommend talking to. Uh, um, someone I used to work with, Professor Loranda Wilson. Um, that the restorative justice that I, you know I what I got what I what I gained in knowledge with respect to restorative justice came from working with her during uh, Fer the Ferguson protests when we were both teaching at the community college and, and um, um, listening circles that we created uh, where we had students being able to talk to members of law enforcement, the mayor of Ferguson attended one. And if you think back 2014, 2015, you can imagine the kind of conversations that came out of that. And that's what sold me on it. So. Um, that would um, so she Professor Wilson would be a good person to talk to if you ever wanted to host a panel on restorative justice because honestly that's where that's where I learned it from. I think she's in the chat. She's in the chat and she's very Professor good. Wilson. Yeah, she's she, you know, was, I, she was at our first one. I got notes all over the place, so I haven't been able to ch to check the chat. <laughs> so nope. if you're listening, good Professor Wilson, you got a shout out yes, and deservedly yes, so. Shout out. Yes. <laughs> um, I can certainly have Laurent. Nice. And uh, to talk to our group, what we've got so far, we're, we're actually going to talk to the legislators, <laughs> and we're actually going to talk to um, some other service providers next week. And we're having um, two legislators on after that. Brian uh, Williams and Jamet Dogan have graciously agreed to address this group. And next week we'll have ACLU and MCU. And I will try to get the gentleman that you. Uh, talked about that's bringing the restorative justice. If he can join us, I will certainly invite him and try. I, I'll give you his. I'll give you his contact. 
I, I'm glad to have him. Maybe he can join us. I mean, short notice, but I'm certainly uh, welcome him to see if he can join us and see what we can do. Um, given our time, we have to hold two minutes and I promise to keep us <laughs> not over an hour and a half. So I thank you, thank you for everything that you've done and that you're doing. I'm glad you were able to answer the questions and people were able to get directly from you exactly what you were seeing, exactly what restorative justice is, exactly what you believe is happening and what they can do about it. As we walk on our Lenten journey, it's more about not, not just about prayer, which we certainly welcome, but it's about what we can do to work, make things around us better. And I'm glad that you were able to participate in informing us what we can do. If you all have any volunteer options, please send those to me so we can send them out to people. If they can serve on any of the panels as community members that you offer, or you want us to serve as a conduit to continue to do those things. This is just a ministry for me, but I can put it through the peace and justice committees of several of the churches, particularly our own, so that if you're looking for people to volunteer with you, if you're looking for people in the city and the county, because both of our churches have uh, people that belong in the city as well as belong in the county. And it's just that the churches are located in the city, but we're from everywhere, including some of our members on from Alton, Illinois. Uh, right. We would we welcome uh, the opportunity to share that and allow people to participate. Thank y'all.